It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, my question is uh, for the, I guess, acting premier today. Um, in last week's fall economic statement, the government announced their intention to review the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan to find, quote, efficiencies. The Ontario Drug Benefit Plan provides drug coverage to every senior in our province, as well as people relying on disability supports and social assistance. Can the Premier tell us what drug benefits are planned in this cut? The Acting Premier. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Well, I want to uh, thank you for the question, and I want to say how pleased we are to present to have presented last week, uh, Speaker, the uh, plan for the people. And in the plan, some people may call it a prop. We call it a very important document, Speaker, a guideline, a blueprint to the future of the province of Ontario. This is a plan for the people that was presented. I, I have to say that uh, if, if you hold it up constantly and. It's, it has to be seen as a prop. I would ask the, the minister to conclude his response. In the plan for the people, which we presented in this legislature last Thursday, Speaker, there were there were $3.2 billion uh, in savings that were found for the people of Ontario and $2.7 billion in money returned to the people of Ontario. Speaker, for the first time, there's relief for families, for individuals, and for businesses, Response. and that reduced the deficit by $500 million, the $15 billion deficit that that Liberal government left. Supplementary. The fall economic statement promises to make health benefits more efficient and fiscally responsible, and it goes on to state that the first target will be drug benefits. Seniors and people with disabilities in this province rely on those benefits. Speaker, what cost-cutting measures is the premier planning for Ontario's drug benefits? Minister, thank you. And again, uh, what our premier has continually said is that not only have we found $3.2 billion in savings without any job losses, all of those are efficiencies, Premier, or, uh, Speaker. Let me take a moment to explain an efficiency. You've got OHIP Plus is a great example. The Liberal government that put OHIP Plus in stated that anybody under 25 would have free drugs. We have gone in and uh, improve that with an efficiency so that anybody under 25 first uses their parents or their own drug benefit and uh, they still have the same coverage they had before our announcement they saved 300 order. million dollars wow. in efficiencies Position and never lost order. a job that's what efficiencies are all about Order. Minister of, Minister of Natural Resources, come to order. Member for King Vaughan, come to order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. The member for Waterloo, come to order. The member for King Vaughan, come to order. The member for Windsor West, come to order. The Minister of Community Safety, come to order. The member for Niagara Falls, come to order. Got a long way to go, folks. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, families across this province have seen very clearly what conservative efficiencies in health care mean. Um, in two, you know, before 28 closed hospitals and 6,000 fired nurses the last time they were in office. The Premier says that $3 billion in cuts in the fall economic statement are just a warm-up. Seniors and families who rely on drug benefits deserve some answers. What is the Premier planning to cut? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you. We are uh, certainly cutting the low-income workers' taxes down to zero. Our, you know, 
when you think about the uh, low income low income individuals and families tax credit speaker this is the one of the most generous tax cuts in for low income workers in a generation 1.1 1. 1 million low income workers will see their taxes reduced you are making $30,000 or a year or less you will pay no provincial income tax speaker zero nada Niente. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Temiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. The Premier says he's looking to squeeze every possible penny, even out of seniors who rely on drug benefits. He says no one will be spared as he searches for savings. But can he explain, or can the Acting Premier explain, how he found $275 million to give a packed tax break to himself and Ontario's wealthiest. Minister, sorry, Acting Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Well, Speaker, we made it very clear during the election that we would not implement any of the former government's punitive tax increases, especially the increases on our low-income families. And that's why, Speaker, our government introduced one of the most generous tax cuts for low-income workers, as I said, in a generation, Speaker. If you're earning $30,000 per year or less, uh, you will pay no income tax. Tax, speaker, no personal income tax, zero. And actually, Speaker, in fact, low-income taxpayers earning just over $30,000 will also relieve, uh, receive a graduated income tax relief. Speaker, this measure, measure will Davenport provide relief to 1.1 million people in the province of Ontario who will be having relief for, for families for the first time in a generation. Supplementary. The Premier says no one will be spared when it comes to government cuts. Now he's looking at taking away from seniors who rely on drug benefits and families tired of hallway care. Side come to order. But he gives himself and some of the wealthiest people in the province a tax cut. How does that make sense? Minister of Finance. Well, Speaker, I realize that the NDP don't want to talk about the 1.1 million people who are going to have relief from their taxes. Let's, in fact, Speaker, they 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 have such a hard Order. time with this. We'll hear from the NDP mem member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, and I'm quoting, Speaker. There's a lot of talk now that you're talking about an in income tax break or zero income tax for low-income people, but you're talking about people who earn so little that they, in fact, don't need a tax break. This member believes that people don't need a tax break. Well, that amount of money that we're investing in low-income families, Speaker, is $500 million is being returned to low-income families. That's the tax break that she's talking about that she says they don't deserve. Final supplementary. <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. Member for the Minister, Minister of Finance protests a bit too much because the high income tax break that he's giving the wealthiest is costing the province twice as much as what they're saying they're going to give the low income people. So the Premier said no one would be spared from cuts. But while he's asking struggling seniors to brace for cuts to drug benefits, he's handing himself and other wealthy Ontarians a tax break. If the Premier truly believes that no one should be spared in his quest for cuts, why is he sparing himself? Mr. Finance. Speaker, you know, the member from Tamistamine Cochrane, fellow Northerner, but I have to say, 
uh, your math is completely wrong. Uh, you have uh, said numbers in this legislature that simply do not add up. You are absolutely and unequivocally wrong in your math. And that should come as no surprise, Speaker, for a party who told us uh, that they had a $7 billion mistake in their own campaign budget, so we can understand. It's really disappointing that they feel that this $500 million investment in low-income families, uh, th th those families do not need a tax break. Speaker, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, how disappointing it is. The NDP deal in chaos. We deal in confidence. The NDP deals in resistance, and we will deal in results. Order. Start the clock. I recognize the member for Mishkikawak, James Bay. My question is for the minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. Yesterday, during a news conference that University Francais de l'Ontario and the Office of French Language Services Commissioner is for money reasons. She said, we recognize the importance of this university for Francophone in Ontario, and this project merits all our attention. And we all know that the offices of the French Language Commissioner was within the Ombudsman Office. Uh, it plays a very a key role for Franco-Ontarian. My question is very simple. What has changed? Minis of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish uh, the member for the questions. Uh, we receive a clear mandate to true efficiency to provide services to Ontarians. And the work of the French Language Services Commissioner will continue within the Ombudsman's office. Since his independence this year, the budget quadrupled, and within the Ombudsman office, will work will the Office of the French Language Surfaces Commissioner. We were elected with a clear mandate to put an end of uh, very expensive uh, practices from the former government. It, we ask us to, to put at risk the future of our children and our grandchildren. Tomorrow afternoon, Andrew Orvat will table a motion to maintain the Office of the French Language Services Commissioner and uh, the project of uh, Université Française. We believe that Franco-Ontarians uh, have the constitutional right to be serviced and educated in French by autonomous uh, organization. This government, will this government approve or support this motion? Mr. President, it's very clear. It's very clear the linguistic rights of minorities will be protected in Ontario by the work of the Ombudsman, and I ask all the opposition to uh, put wrong information in the media. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the importance of this project. That's why we studied the project to finance these projects with the deficit uh, of $15 billion and the deficit of $340 billion, uh, and we spend uh, $12 billion a year to service the debt. We are honest, and when Ontario will be prosper again, we review these very important projects.
question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Social Services Minister. One woman on three will suffer abuse. Experience violence. Indigenous women are three times more likely to be a victim of a violent crime and to experience spousal violence than non-Indigenous women. Immigrant and refugee women are seen to be more vulnerable to violence due to language barriers, isolations from their family, precarious work, and uncertain legal status. Women with disabilities are three times more Member likely to experience violence, and lesbian or bisexual women are three times more likely to report intimate partner violence. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House how diverse voices from women across this province will be included in the discussions about ending violence against women? Minister of Children, Community and Thank Social you very much, Services. Speaker, and to my colleague from uh, Mississauga Centre, she has been a strong advocate for women, vulnerable women in this legislature, asking the tough questions on human trafficking, sex trafficking of women, and of course here today on violence against women. I really commend you for doing that. Thank you so much. I'd also like to once again um, welcome those from OAF that are here today that are the front lines uh, helping us with violence against women right throughout Ontario. And uh, the work that they're doing is very much appreciated by me and my ministry. Uh, today, I had the opportunity to address with them and to announce that our government for the people will be engaging in consultations with the 48 existing violence against women coordinating committees across the province, and they will help me integrate and improve services for women in Ontario who need it most. It is these frontline workers who we will be consulting with so that we can ensure that we get the most important services and the most important wraparound programming to the women who need it Member most. Toronto Unfortunately, the order. Ontario and the Democratic Party doesn't want to actually talk about the solution. Response. They just want to complain. I'd like to thank again Member the member, Hamilton Hamilton Mountain come member order. from our government party for continually and consistently bringing up this very important issue. I know that all members condemn violence against Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank the minister for her answer and to maintain her engagement to fight violence against women. Girls experience violence in their lives, whether through spousal violence, sexual harassment, or human trafficking. This is critical that services across our province are coordinated and all women who need assistance have access to emergency shelters, counselling, safety planning, planning, transitional housing and referral services and more. Violence against women also has a significant economic cost, estimated at $7.4 billion, which includes medical, legal, lost income and productivity costs. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how the government will expand access to services for women who have experienced violence and assist frontline staff? Minister. Thank you very much, the Speaker. Um, earlier this morning, I was uh, fortunate again to be with OAF and to announce that our government for the people will be investing $11.5 million to frontline support to over 400 agencies throughout this great province so that we can protect more women. And let me be perfectly clear, Speaker, I am so proud of the work that my former colleague, my colleague of Labour has done it previously in her role uh, as our women's critic before we for served in government. I also want to single out a few men in our caucus who have inspired me day in and day out, and that is our Minister of Natural Resources, who has Order. stood up for women in rural communities right across this province. Randy Order. Hillier, the member from Lennox, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington, the Minister of Housing, who first ensured that there was a, a, a VAW centre Order. in his home community of Brockville, and of course my Order. colleague, the Minister uh, Todd Smith. Smith from Economic Development and Trade, who ensured that I got to see three outs in his community. We need strong women supporting women. We also need strong men. Thank you. Stop the clock. And I say to all members of the House, it's a little more difficult to watch the clock when there's constant outbursts from members in the House, and I have to call them to order. We are trying to pay close attention to the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, member for Nickelbelt. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le Premier. My question is for the Premier. When a loved one is fighting cancer, the last thing they should worry about is where, whether or not they can afford to pay for the treatment that works best for them. Yet, Speaker, if the treatment is in the hospital, it is completely free. The minute you can be treated at home, you are on your own. You have to pay. People much prefer to be treated at home, and take-home cancer drugs are often the best treatment options. Yet, Ontario refuses to cover take-home cancer medication. Does the Premier agree that it is time to guarantee universal access to take-home cancer drugs? Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Question. I know there has been dis some discussion about this. Of course, people would rather be treated at home for cancer as well as for many other um, illnesses and, and health problems. However, uh, there are situations where a number of the take-home cancer uh, remedies or uh, drugs can be covered under policies. Other times, people have policies that cover them. Universal access is not necessary. We make sure that people who are not able to pay for their own cancer drugs or aren't covered by a policy, can have access under the Trillium program and other programs. We don't want anybody who has cancer to go without treatment, and that's what we will make sure is covered. It's not necessary to do it with the universal access program, per se. Supplementary. While well, the Premier and the Minister look for drug benefit cuts, cancer patients will tell them that the smartest saving comes from people moving out of the hospital when it is the best treatment option. But our current system forces people to stay in the hospital if they cannot afford to pay for their take-home cancer drug, even when this is not the best treatment option. Tomorrow, we will be debating a motion calling on funding for take-home cancer drug. Will the minister and the Premier support it. Minister. In fact, I think it is important to note that Ontario spends close to a billion dollars a year on cancer drugs and supportive therapies, including $543 million for take-home cancer drugs. So those cancer drugs are available for people that need them, and we will continue to do so. In fact, what we want to do is expand access because we know there are many new cancer and other drugs coming on the market. We want to expand the uh, drugs that are available to people, including more and more personalized types of medications. But as I indicated in my previous comments, it's not necessary to have a universal access program as long as we have programs that make sure that people who are not able to afford them have them. We have that under the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, the Trillium Benefit Program. So people need to be reassured that if they need take-home cancer remedies, they will get them. Thank you. Next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Now, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Farmers and food processors in my riding have been telling me that many of Ontario's regulatory requirements are out of date, unnecessary, and don't provide any real protections for them. Red tape is costing our farmers their time, money, and causing a lot of frustration that makes it more difficult for their businesses to get ahead. Yesterday, the minister <clears throat> announced that his ministry is proposing to cut red tape and regulatory burdens for dairy and meat processors in the province. Can the minister please tell us what this government is doing to target costly and unnecessary red tape to help those in the agri-food sector while maintaining rules to keep Ontario's, Ontarians and the food they consume safe? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry for the important question. And as he mentioned, I want to assure everyone that our government, first and foremost, is committed to food safety and public safety. First, food processors play a key role in keeping our food safe, and with the proposed regulations, food safety will stay top of mind. Yesterday, I was pleased to announce that our government is proposing to cut red tape and regulatory burdens for dairy and meat processing in Ontario. I had the opportunity to tour a family dairy-owned processing facility yesterday in Mississauga, where I heard from the owners about red tape headaches and the cost of unnecessary regulations. 
If approved, the changes we are proposing will make it easier and faster for the agri-food companies to do business in Ontario, and I look forward to providing more details in the supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank to the minister for the leadership in making life more affordable and for those in the agri-food industry in Ontario. We know that this government is committed to cutting red tape and regulatory burdens for all businesses in Ontario and to make them more competitive and to reduce operating co costs across the board. The proposed changes to both acts are simple and efficient steps. They are long overdue to help our agri-food sector, like those in the meat and dairy processing industries. Can the minister tell us how the proposed changes will help strengthen both our dairy and meat processing industries? Minister. Well, thank, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the supplementary question. The proposed changes will allow meat processing plant operators to save $300 every three years by no longer needing to reapply for the license. In another proposed change, owners will no longer who want to operate meat plants will be able to voluntarily give up their licenses, avoiding a number of current uh, um, administrative hoops. Presently, if you have a meat packing plant and you want to quit, you have to apply to get rid of the license. The proposed changes for dairy processors would amend requirements relating to receiving bays, plant ceiling heights, and floor drains, which would reduce the cost for small dairy processors who currently can spend up to one-third of their construction budget on outdating building requirements. Requirements will be focused on ensuring food safety outcomes Spons. instead of prescriptive construction regulations. We know how important these processors are, especially in rural communities, and our government is committed to ensuring their businesses can be competitive. While follow Thank you. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario Place was built and paid for by the people of Ontario to celebrate this great province of ours. After a public consultation process, Ontario Place is being renewed with the Bill Davis Trail, with green spaces, with regular events, and a beach with what I've been told is the cleanest water to swim in in the City of Toronto. However, last week the Premier tabled legislation to formally dissolve the Ontario Place Board, giving him full control of this public asset. The last time the Premier set his sights on Toronto's waterfront, back when he was a city councillor, he met with developers to cook up a plan behind closed doors to sell off public land and to make way for a Ferris wheel and a mega mall. The Premier's vision also included an NFL stadium on land controlled by Mario Cordellucci, who was the top fundraiser for Mayor Rob Ford. Has the Premier or his staff had any discussion with developers or lobbyists about Question. developing Ontario Place, and if so, what did they discuss? Everybody. Premier, dishonest. Minister of Tourism. I have to ask the Premier to withdraw his unparliamentary remark. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. The government, as has been stated before, is committed to making Ontario Place a spectacular, world-class destination. As you will recall, it was a PC government under John Roberts that created Ontario Place, and it'll be a place the PC government ensures that it is a great tourist space for decades to come. We look forward to working with the City of Toronto and the CNE for the future redevelopment of Ontario Place, and the government will explore the full development potential of the Ontario Place site. We look forward to providing more details as plans develop. Ontario Place, as it is, remains open for the public. Supplementary. When you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. When you say open to the public, does it mean that it will remain in public hands? In 2013, the City of Toronto voted 40-4 to, to oppose a downtown Toronto casino. Not only would a casino cannibalize economic activity and suck the lifeblood out of downtown neighbourhoods, it would also take business away from the Woodbine Casino. Will the Premier assure us that plans for Ontario Place will never include a casino? Will there be a robust public consultation process involving the Ontario taxpayers who paid for and own Ontario Place, or will the Premier cook up his own plans for this public asset with his friends in back rooms? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you again for this supplemental question. 
Mr. Speaker, we're going to ensure Ontario Place is updated to once again make it a world-class tourist destination. Many Ontarians of a certain generation share nostalgic memories of Ontario Place, and we have an incredible opportunity that we need to be bold and creative with. I know citizens across the province are excited, as I am, as we embark on the development of this project. We're exploring all opportunities, Mr. Speaker, to move forward with Order. developing the site, including seeking bids globally. Mr. Speaker, we look forward to providing more information as the plans develop. Next question, the member for Orléans. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the Francophone Affairs Minister. Today, I would like to talk to the uh, Anglophone, Francophone, and Francophile uh, population. We did wonderful work together to move forward with the French language during the last few years. Uh, there is a law on judicial tribunals, a law on uh, French services, uh, and also uh, the law on uh, planning in French. Also, uh, the uh, school boards in French and the independence of French, uh, OEF, uh, a uh, French uh, ministry, and, uh, to, and uh, a law creating a French university. Unfortunately, for the Conservatives, we are repeating the disaster uh, from the closing of the Montfort Hospital. How could we destroy this by uh, claiming that you're trying to save money? And uh, you have the gal uh, to pro to suggest an, an independent uh, to ask him to be uh, working with the ombudsman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to add this. I would like to add a few details to the list uh, of what uh, the uh, pr the former government gave us a deficit of $15 billion and payment of $12.5 billion. And it's incredible, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that the former government gave debts to uh, generations to come. Mr. Speaker, the office of the commissioner was integrated with the ombudsman and with respect to the uh, Francophone University, the former government had 15 years to create that university, had 15 years to fund that university, to put money aside in a durable way, but they did not do it. It's only in 2017 that they decided to move forward with that important project for Franco-Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, we do not have the means to create that university because of the mess they left behind. Order. Order. <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. <laughs> order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is a lot of emotion today. The Conservatives claim that they do not have enough money for Francophone University in Toronto or a project on the basic income to uh, foster care for children in Ontario. The, prime, the Premier will have uh, important gains. It's ridiculous. I think that the Prime Minister's federal campaign and the Ontarian one is a bit uh, not on the right track. When we attack uh, the Francophone affairs in Ontario, no, not only do we attack Ontario, but also Canada. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Could the minister tell us today, directly, what are the other cuts with respect to the uh, French services and the French programs in Ontario? To the minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the uh, member to 
stop her divisive uh, politics. We are not attacking the Ontario Francophone affairs. We preserve uh, the Francophone rights in Ontario. We're doing what the liberals, liberals didn't do. We are being honest to them. We're telling them that we could not fund this university. And I would like to quote someone. Sorry, I have the I have it in French. I dit l'année dernière. This government has been in power for what? 14 years. When you bring something forward like this about 6 months before an election without the money really being put in place. This is more exploratory than anything else. What you're really doing is being Apologize to the minister. Stop the clock. Once again, I, I had to cut off the minister. Order. Government side, come to order. I apologize to the minister for having to cut her off, but I had to cut her off because of the noise from her colleagues. I could not hear what she was saying. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business reported that Ontario businesses in 2017 faced over $15 billion in red tape costs. Wow. That's more wow. than twice as much as businesses in Quebec and three times as much as businesses in British Columbia. Yeah. Over the span of 15 years, the previous Liberal government strangled small businesses in Ontario with regulations, red tape and unnecessary burdens. Last week, Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to hear the Minister of Finance talk about the cost that overregulation has on Ontario's job creators and small businesses in his fall economic statement. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please expand on the work that our government for the people is doing to reduce red tape? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, thanks very much uh, to the member from Carleton for the question this morning. And uh, this is a very important issue that we're dealing with in reducing the strangling uh, red tape in Ontario. This is a file that's been intriguing to me because this is where I started in 2011 after the election as the critic responsible for small businesses and red tape reduction. And I said last week, Mr. Speaker, that it's important to think of Bill 47 as just one part of the government strategy to make Ontario open for business. And there's a lot Opposition more to come, to Mr. Order. Speaker. Later today, Today, we'll begin third reading debate on Bill 47 in the House. I can tell you as well, Mr. Speaker, that the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis estimated that the reforms in Bill 148 added $23 billion in costs over two years. Speaker, it was a cinder block around the ankles of small businesses right across Lots. Ontario. So we're going to make this one step to eliminate red tape to ensure that these businesses don't sink to the bottom, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Back to the minister. Speaker, it's encouraging to hear what our government is doing for small businesses across the province. Over 15 years, the last government doubled the amount of regulations in Ontario, and it did Member everything for Waterloo, it could come to, order. to put small businesses out of business in Ontario. But our government for the people understands that red tape and overregulation cost the average Ontario small business $33,000 per year. Wow. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to reduce the more than 380,000 regulations plaguing small businesses in Ontario? Minister. Well, thanks again to the member from Carleton. Another great question. As our finance minister pointed out in his speech last week in the plan for the people, there are approximately 331 statutes, including 380,000 regulations wow. in Ontario. And that amount of regulation overwhelmingly kills small businesses, Speaker. That's why we have a plan to reduce burdensome red tape and regulation by 25% by 2022. And, Speaker, we're going to get that done, but we're going to go even further than that. Last week, our government announced our intention to accelerate the depreciation of capital assets for small businesses. We're hoping that the members of the NDP will support us in spite of them in committee calling businesses spiteful yesterday, Mr. Speaker. Wow. We're also hoping that for once we'll get help from Justin Trudeau and the federal government to make Ontario small businesses work and make great businesses and very good jobs here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Well,
order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. The member for Windsor Tecumseh will take down the sign. The member for Hampton East Stony Creek will take down his sign. Minister for Natural Resources and Forestry will please come to order. Come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today is the Trans Day of Remembrance. This day memorializes those who have been murdered and who have died as a result of suicide and as a result of transphobia and anti trans violence. Today is a somber day, and we pay our deepest respects. Speaker, Will the Premier be at the Trans Day of Remembrance flag raising this afternoon? Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I really want to say uh, thank you to the member opposite for uh, bringing forward uh, this, this important um, uh, question. I will be there today, along with many members of the Government Caucus. I am proud Senator, that I was one of three co-sponsors of the bill that made sure that today is recognized to in Ontario as Transgender Remembrance Day, along with my colleague Natalie Rose from Ottawa Vanier in the Liberal Caucus and the former MPP for Parkdale High Park, Sherry DeNovo, who's here today. I'm really proud of the work that we've done as an assembly, Order. as well as the uh, Deputy Premier's role in bringing forward Toby's Law into the province of Ontario. We've come a long way. We have more to go, and I look forward to standing with every single member in this legislature today in condemning hate Order. toward any group that is underrepresented and any group that needs its support. Response. So I'm happy to support the transgender community today, and I will continue to support them as minister responsible for LGBTQ issues. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect to the Minister of uh, Children, Community and Social Services, it's not about you. We want to hear from the Premier. By proclaiming November 20th each year as the Trans Day of Remembrance, the province of Ontario publicly mourns and honours the lives of those who might otherwise be forgotten and gives trans people and their allies a chance to stand together in vigil. In past comments, the Premier stated that gender identity is nothing more than liberal ideology that should not be taught in schools. Order. Trans and LGBTQ2S students have been scrubbed from the Ontario curriculum, erased. The Premier's earlier language is not only hurtful, it's dangerous. Order. Words matter. That sort of language encourages extreme views, even within the Premier's own party. Will the Premier unequivocally renounce his earlier comments and send a clear message to trans people Question. on this significant day? Minister. Thanks very much to the member from London uh, for the question. I want to be very clear. The Premier yesterday stood unequivocally in support of the trans community and said so in his own words that he stands by this. Earlier today, during question period, my ministry, on behalf of our government for the people, is, 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 put out a press release ensuring that we support the trans community. My colleague, the Minister of Education, stood here yesterday and told you to your face that we stand with the trans community, and we're proud to stand with the trans community and the LGBTQ community. Order. And I will be For very North Center, come to order. making sure that within my ministry we continue to place those supports as a priority for any underrepresented group in the province of Ontario, particularly for the children that I represent in my ministry. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hey! Love the hey! My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. This past week, the minister travelled to Sault Ste. Marie and attended the first of many forestry roundtables. I'm pleased to hear that our government, for the people, 
is committed to developing a sound, comprehensive forestry strategy that will help revitalize the forestry industry in Ontario. This is an initiative that Northern Ontario needs and hardworking forestry sector workers have been asking for. Thousands of people are employed in this industry, and it contributes $15.3 billion to our economy every year. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to lessening the regulatory burdens imposed by the former Liberal government. Can the minister update the legislature on his roundtable discussions about our plan that prioritizes lifting regulatory burdens and cutting red tape? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for his question. Yes, last week I had the opportunity to travel to Sault Ste. Marie for the first of many roundtables we're having with the forestry stakeholders to ask them about how our government can help them reach their potential and secure the Ontario jobs that are available in the, in the forestry economy after having so many years of being stifled by the previous Liberal government. Right. The insights gathered through those meetings and those uh, roundtables will assist us in developing our forestry strategy, one that employs thousands of people across this province. I want to thank all of the industry leaders that attended the, the roundtables to give us their thoughts. It was a very, very product, productive session. And I also want to thank those who have participated through written submissions and those electronically, electronically and encourage them to continue to send us those, uh, those submissions as well, because that's how we will make forestry the leader that it should be all across this great province under this Ford government. Supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry for that response. It's great to hear that the roundtable session in Sault Ste. Marie was a huge success. I look forward to hearing more about the forestry discussion in the coming, coming months. Unlike the former Liberal government, our government, for the people, knows the importance of the forestry industry and that many families across Ontario depend on the forestry sector. I know that our government, for the people, We'll work hard to continue to grow this industry. This industry can create more jobs and more opportunities in Northern Ontario and across our entire province. Can the minister expand on our government's commitment to the forestry sector and the people of Ontario that are employed in it? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Let me be crystal clear. Our government stands with the forestry sector and the thousands of people that are employed in it. We will not be influenced by special interest groups that seem to be only satisfied when Ontarians lose their jobs. We are sending a message clearly that Ontario is open for business and the forestry sector is a huge part of that. We want to hear from the people on this issue. We want to hear what, from them what we can do to maximize their success in this sector. Our government will support the needs of our job creators in the forestry industry so that Ontario can lead once again in this great country. Ontario is open for business. Next question, the member for Essex. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mon question est pour... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier's ethical standards for his cabinet ministers. According to multiple reports, Order. female staff were working for the then opposition Conservatives came forward Order. with a complaint of sexual misconduct concerning the Minister of Finance. Last Thursday, the Premier Order. said that he would not be taking any actions on these allegations because an investigation had already occurred. Yesterday, the acting premier said, quote, there was nothing Order. there to be investigated, end quote, which indicates that there had been no investigation at all, Speaker. Order. Can the premier tell us Member who conducted Niagara the West, investigation and when the investigators' findings will be made public and available? Minister for Children, Community and Social Services, come to order. Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we did a thorough third-party investigation there was not one ounce of any evidence, zero evidence. I have 1,000% confidence in my minister, and I stand behind him 1,000%. Supplementary. 
The Speaker, the Premier says there was zero evidence. He should make that public for the, the people of the province and for order. the members of this House. Speaker, Government House Leader, come to order. The Premier Minister has stated that there is zero tolerance for sexual to misconduct, order. but it's unclear for King what Bond, action, if any, has been taken here. If an independent investigation has happened, the government should be able to tell us who conducted the investigation Children, and what exactly they found from that investigation. And if not, they must allow for an independent investigation into these order. allegations and ask the minister to step aside while it's being conducted. Which one is it going to be? What a shame. Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, again, there was a thorough investigation, third-party investigation, with zero evidence. I find it pretty disgusting. I find it pretty disgusting, Mr. Speaker. They would lower themselves to this level once again. They have nothing productive to say that don't say it at all. Next question, the member for King Bond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. There is a campaign afoot to revise the history of our country and to attack Canada's father of confederation. Yesterday, vandals shamefully defaced the statue of Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald. In the words of his modern biography, Richard Gwynn, no Macdonald, no Canada. Sir John A. Was an in by instinct was a coalition builder. His vision is what made confederation possible by bringing distinct entities and identities, English and French, and vast regions together to create one of the greatest, freest, most prosperous democracies in the world. While McDonald is far from perfect, we should reject what Jason Kenney has called a campaign of historical vandalism. Our founding Prime Minister was the first national democratic leader in the world to attempt to extend the right to vote to women. He welcomed eight provinces and territories into confederation. He founded the now RCMP and That's built true. a national railway to unite our country from sea to sea. Can the minister affirm our government's determination to stand up for our history and celebrate the contributions of this incredible Canadian? Yeah. Minister of Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from King Vaughan for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. Crystal. Let me be crystal clear. We will not let anti-Canadian agitators dictate who is good and bad. I stand at this house today to condone this act of, violence, of, by, of vandalism. Acts like this degrade public discourse around the important issues facing our province today. Now, in regards to John A. Macdonald, John A. Macdonald's thought repre represented the common norms accepted during his time. It is foolish, Mr. Speaker, and indeed detrimental to Canadian society as a whole to view the very founders of our country without taking stock of the societal norms at the time. Every person in Canadian Response. history would be evil. Even the founder of the modern NDP would be seen as a boogeyman. I want to condone this act, Mr. Speaker, and leave the House with the old saying, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat. Thank you, Speaker. Sir John A. had a vision for this country, a vision, of prosperous, a vision for a prosperous Canada that provided refuge and economic opportunity to its citizens. He advanced a vision of prosperity by supporting the development and growth of our industry and our agriculture sector. He had a vision to connect our vast frontier and unite our people by building a railway from sea to sea. He was determined to strengthen our economy and to defend our sovereignty from American expansionism, and he promised, and I quote, one people, one in necessity, one in business, one in trade, one in prosperity, and one in the prospects of our future. To the minister, how is our government, in our most recent economic update, realizing the vision of Sir John A., a province where the aspirations of opportunity could be achieved, a province that is the economic leader of our confederation in a country strong and free? You're here. Minister. To the Minister of Economic Development. Of Economic Development. Well, thank you very much uh, for another question. Sir John A. Macdonald certainly did forge a strong, independent nation, and his legacy as Prime Minister includes a belief that strong, independent nations need to be economically competitive yeah, and yeah. strong to ensure its survival. In Sir John A.'s footsteps, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that our Ontario for the people is making sure that Ontario is open for business. Later this afternoon, the House will begin third reading on a Bill 47 debate. We're making sure that manufacturing
manufacturing can grow and expand here in Ontario. Later this week, I'll be meeting with my provincial counterparts from across Canada to break down interprovincial trade barriers yeah, yeah. to ensure that business flows from province to province. And as I stated, I hope that this afternoon the federal government shows us something that's positive for businesses in Canada. We're doing it here. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Today, the Poverty Hurts Children and Families report was released with startling statistics. One in five children under the age of 18 lives in poverty in Ontario. For a province as wealthy as ours, that is appalling. The report clearly states that child poverty is linked to things like precarious work, yet this government is freezing the minimum wage. Incredibly unaffordable childcare, yet this government has made changes that will allow big box privatized childcare providers to milk more out of parents. And inadequate social assistance benefits, but this government cut the planned increases to social assistance in half. Speaker, will the minister commit to reading the report and working towards implementing its recommendations? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much uh, for that important question. I think uh, it's, it's good that the NDP are finally starting to talk about some of the social issues in the province. And uh, I've, I've been long waiting. In fact, last week I was expecting them to uh, bring some questions up, but they weren't. Uh, look, one in seven people in the province of Ontario right now live in poverty. One in five children, as the member opposite stated, live in poverty. That's unacceptable. She's right. We are a wealthy province and we can be doing better. But the problem is, for the past 15 years, we've had a patchwork disjointed system that has not supported people being lifted out of poverty and into the workforce and into contributing into society. So what we have said, and I'm excited for Thursday, is to announce our new plan that will lift more people up, provide wraparound supports, and get people back into the workforce and, and uh, supporting their families. I've often said Fair. in this House that the best social circumstances are when people are able to work, and the best social program is a job, and that's what we're working for together Fair. in this government. Supplementary. Supplementary. Speaker, poverty discriminates. Due to structural inequalities, racism and discrimination, Poverty rates are higher among the most marginalized groups than the rest of the population. Children whose families are Indigenous, Black and other racialized people, immigrants, people with disabilities, and lone parent families are impacted the most. Speaker, what systemic and equity-based approaches will this government take to address the higher poverty rates among marginalized groups? And can the minister please be specific about the systemic and equity-based approaches? Thank you. Minister. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate the member opposite's passion. Uh, again, I'm happy to uh, happy to address this, but I'll have more to say on Thursday as we uh, as we outline some of our changes so that we can provide a holistic approach for the individual that uh, that we want to support through so social assistance reform. And I can tell you, uh, she's talking about all of the people, the vulnerable people that are within this large ministry. But we're not just stopping in this large ministry that used to be five ministers in the previous Liberal administration. I am working with the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. I'm working with the Minister of Health. I'm working with the Minister of Housing. I'm working with the Minister of Finance. I'm working with the Minister of Economic Development so that we can ensure that there are wraparound supports for the individuals so that they can lift themselves up out of poverty and that we can support them better. But if the member opposite wants to continue to keep people in poverty, she won't support our initiatives. And what we're trying to do is making sure more people get to work and that they are more successful in society. That's Order. how we're going to lift people out of poverty. That's what we're going to do. Order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. 
Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. I couldn't hear. If there's a loud din in the house, I can't hear everything that's being said. I wish I could. If the members would cooperate with me, I could. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, the disastrous job-killing Bill 148 has wrecked havoc on job creators and workers across the province of Ontario. And new data shows that since Bill 148 came into effect, 56,100 workers from the ages of 15 to 24 have lost their jobs. I personally know peers and friends who have lost hours and jobs because of Bill 148. The Financial Accountability Officer warned the previous Liberal government that recklessly increasing the cost of doing business would result in job losses, but they, of course, chose to ignore the evidence. Could the minister inform this House about what our government is doing to encourage job creators to hire more young people and to send the message that Ontario truly is open for business? Minister of Labour. I'd like to thank the member for Ni from Niagara West for the question and the great work that he does in advocating for his constituents. As the members on this side of the House know, we have long advocated for Ontario to once again be the economic engine of Canada. As Minister of Labour, I had committed to carry out a careful review of Bill 148 while consulting with job creators, workers and union leaders. The figures that the member has cited shows that creating an environment of endless regulations and higher costs for business results in fewer job opportunities, particularly for our young people. I'm proud to say that the Making Ontario Open for Business Act is one of the things our government has done and is doing that will restore confidence in our economy. Mr. Speaker, the Act provides Response. pragmatic solutions while maintaining our commitment <laughs> to ensuring that Ontario remains a safe place to work that protects the most vulnerable. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's clear that we can see this government and Premier was elected with a strong mandate to return this province to its rightful place as the economic engine of Canada. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The report released today by the Montreal Economic Institute notes that after the passage of Bill 148 in Ontario, which included a 21 per cent increase in the minimum wage, the price of meals in our province in the restaurant in restaurants in our province increased three times faster than other provinces. Wow. Many restaurants have reduced hours as a result of these impacts, and reduced hours of operation is resulting in fewer hours for their employees. So what is this minister's message to job creators and workers about how Bill 47 will finally end the NDP Liberal attack on jobs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question again. We were elected to be the government for the people, and that means we have to ensure that more opportunities exist for job creators to invest and to grow their businesses. At the same time, we must ensure that all workers can be confident that they can find good-paying jobs. At $14 an hour, Ontario has one of the highest minimum wages in Canada. The previous government had imposed a massive 21 per cent increase in employment costs in Ontario business just this year. Instead of helping, this rapid increase led to a reduction in hours for many workers, and for our younger workers, it led to a reduction in their job opportunities. We are maintaining Waterloo, the come to order. at its current level. And Response. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, future increases will be determined by an Inflation, not how badly the government of the day wants to be re-elected, Mr. Speaker. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Recently, the living wage in Niagara rose to $17.99 an hour and a 2.3 per cent increase from last year. This is the basic wage required just to live, with 72 per cent of total wages going to essentials like housing, food, transportation, and childcare. The numbers are similar across Ontario. 
People are falling further and further behind, and this government has made things worse by freezing the minimum wage at $14 an hour. Will this minister admit that chasing a low-wage economy in a race to the bottom will be devastating for Ontario families as income inequality grows year by year? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, uh, no, Mr. Speaker, I, I won't, because uh, what we are doing now with the Ministry of Economic Development, job creation and trade, yeah, yeah, yeah. is creating good-paying jobs for the people of Ontario. For some reason, Mr. Speaker, the members of the third party, the, uh, the NDP, the opposition party, they want to embrace a minimum wage economy. We don't want to embrace a minimum wage economy, Mr. Speaker. Order. That's why we've set out to embark on creating good-paying jobs, Order. jobs that have benefits Mr. so that people Saint don't Paul have to live in poverty, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to say with the passage Center, of Bill 47, hopefully imminent later today or tomorrow, we'll take that first step to ensuring we're creating good-paying jobs in Ontario. We lost jobs, Mr. Speaker, when Bill 40, 148 oh came in, and we knew that was going to happen because every job creator in Ontario Response. told us that that was what was going to happen if the Liberals brought in their election-buying scheme of Bill 148. <laughs> I'm going to ask the government house leader to withdraw his unparliamentary remark. Withdraw, Speaker. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Paying workers enough to live on should be a basic responsibility. We know that when working families at the low end of the income scale get an increase, that money goes immediately and directly back into the economy for basic consumer goods. This increases economic activity and is proven to be good for business. Yep. Decent living wages are proven to increase worker productivity and decrease costs for our health care and social supports. When will this government drag itself out of this antiquated, backwards economic strategy and embrace a living wage economy like other modern economies around the world? Great Minister. Mr. Speaker, Bill 148, which was brought in by the previous Liberal government and then supported uh, by the NDP, uh, is a job-killing piece of legislation, and it's proven to be just that, Mr. Speaker. We went through a lengthy process in committee and travelling this bill across Ontario last year. We've heard loud and clear from job creators in Ontario that this was indeed going to be a job-killing piece of legislation, and that's what it was. In the first month it was implemented, we lost 50,000 jobs in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we want to create good-paying jobs, and to do that, we have to create the environment and for businesses to Come expand. Over. Yesterday, in committee, members of the NDP called job creators spiteful, and the member from Sudbury said that the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, which represents businesses, were bottom feeders, Change Mr. Response. Speaker. That's terrible. We won't stand for that. We're going to create good-paying jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Order. Order. We have a very special guest in the Visitors Gallery along with his family, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Brant in the 37th, 38th and 39th Parliament, and Speaker of the Ontario Legislature in the 40th and 41st Parliament, Dave Levac and his family are here with us today. Welcome. I'd like to uh, reiterate the invitation to all members to attend uh, the, the celebration of Dave's career, uh, where we unveil his portrait this evening at 6.15 p.m. Look forward to seeing you all there. I know that the uh, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport has a point of order. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to clarify, I may have used the word condone when I meant condemn, so I just want to clarify that for the record. Thank you. It is in order for members to correct their own record. Point of order, the member for Thornhill. President, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to correct my record that it's at 2 o'clock. 1 o'clock for the transgender flag raising for commemoration. For the celebration 
of the uh, raising of the flag for the Transgender uh, Day of Remembrance. Thank you very much. The member for Burlington on a point of order. Yes, uh, uh, I apologize to my friend Jane Shale. I can't see without my glasses, and she's up there. She's the executive director of Holding Men's and Nor Norfolk's Women's Service. And thank you so much for being here today, Jane. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.